Good day and happy Sunday. Uh, it's good to be here with you. And once again, I thank you for inviting me into your places. And um, I pray that your week has been good. I pray that uh, you have been blessed of God. And uh, we look forward to sharing today. I look forward to sharing to you today uh, from First Peter again. As we continue in that um, sermon series, A Living Hope. When we consider the four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we find there that each one records Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem during the Passover festival on that first Sunday of the week. Often we refer to this to as the Passion Week or the Passion of Christ. But focusing on Matthew's account, we find there Matthew describing in chapter 21 uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And we find that upon arriving in Jerusalem, Jesus went into the temple, and there he began to drive out the money changers and sellers of the pigeons. And then after accomplishing that, he left and would return the next day. And when Jesus did return, uh, he was challenged by the chief priests and elders regarding his authority to do the things that he did in the temple. And Jesus responded to their challenge by, uh, with two parables. The parables of the two sons and the parable of the tenants. Clearly, if you would read through those two parables, Jesus there describing the unbelief of the chief priests and elders, and we can call them the Pharisees, and the severe consequences that would follow unless they repented. And after the parable of the two sons, Jesus said to the Pharisees, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes will go into the kingdom before you. And that's in Matthew chapter 21, verse 31. Of course, uh, you read through that uh, account, it didn't stop the challenges from the ruling religious leaders. They would challenge Jesus, for example, in regard to paying taxes to Caesar. And of course, they failed at that time too. And when that failed, they sent to Sadducees to ask Jesus to question Jesus about the resurrection of the dead. And it's interesting to note that the Sadducees uh, did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Then that's kind of ironic. But this also failed. Then I think when we consider all that happened just here in this short, brief moment, uh, we, would, we could say with, with, uh, with good reason that the Pharisees were determined to have Jesus arrested and killed. And of course, eventually they would succeed. However, next the Pharisees sent an expert in the law. That text calls this person a lawyer. To challenge Jesus. And this lawyer asked Jesus, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus responded, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. This is from Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 40. And, of course, Jesus answered correctly. And as we ponder and think about Matthew's account, I think we can ask this question with good reason. We can ask the chief uh, priests and elders, did they love their neighbor? Did they love their neighbor? And I don't think we should be too hasty to answer the question, because consider with me what Jesus said to the apostles in the upper room just a few short days later, hours before his arrest in the garden. He said to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And this is from John's Gospel account, chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. So let's take some time, and as we soon will be reading First Peter together, uh, to contemplate the encounter Jesus had with the Pharisees. Ponder that. And consider Jesus' command here from John's Gospel to love one another. Then let me offer you this question. Why do Christians find it so hard to love one another? Why do Christians find it so hard to love one another? So please turn now in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. And so we have a little bit of context. Uh, let's read, begin in verse 13 to the end of the chapter. Verse 13 to the end of the chapter. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you 
at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but it was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Verse 24, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time that we can be together under the uh, authority of your word, the inspired word of God. And we ask, O Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate our minds and move our hearts and change us and mold us to become more and more like Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, uh, our focus will be uh, first 22 to 25 as we have, I guess, finally, we could say finally, uh, but we have arrived at the end of chapter 1. Keeping in mind, as always, that context is king, and that time is not as friend as well, I would encourage you to read Peter's letter again sometime today or in the next day, and especially uh, after this message, uh, chapter 1. And the question is why? Well, the foundation of Peter's letter is clearly expressed by the apostle in these first 25 verses of his letter. <clears throat> the apostle Peter's audience, we see, had once been far from God in ignorance and sin. Uh, we find that in verse 14. But God, in his great mercy before the foundation of the world, by the power of the Spirit, had caused them to be born again. You find that in verse 3. We go to the Apostle Paul, who put it, put it in a second letter to the Corinthians in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And friends, this is all a work of God alone. For Paul would continue and say, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. You'll find this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. We must remember, too, we learned way at the beginning, that the first century audience were, were dealing, uh, as described in the text itself, with various trials. That's in verse 6. Various trials were coming their way. These first century uh, Christian brothers and sisters that were scattered throughout the Roman Empire, present-day Turkey, were facing a variety of trials from a variety of places, possibly from family, possibly from friends, from workplaces, even from local governments. And we know through church history, eventually even the Roman Empire would be enforced there, uh, uh, a part of the persecution. And we find here the Apostle Peter's pastoral heart encouraging and reminding these exiles, these first century Christians, struggling with various trials of the living hope that they had received because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's from verse 3. You see, their future was secure in Christ, and one day Christ would set things right upon his second coming. And Peter really describes what a day that will be when he said this, it will result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ Jesus. That's verse 7. But in the meantime, by the sanctifying work of God, the Holy Spirit, we see that in verse 2, they were able to rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And that's verse 8. In their trials, they were able to rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. In the meantime, they were to prepare their minds for action, to be sober-minded. This is really important because when our emotions are, are running ahead of us, 
we can have all sorts of imaginations and all sorts of ideas that are not, not really good for us and certainly not scriptural, not biblical. We need to have our minds uh, set for action, to be sober-minded, to think clearly, to know our Bibles, to pray in all those times and these times of trials and, and temptations as well. They were, Peter's encouraging the rest on the truth that they had received a great salvation, that God's grace was poured out, on, out to them through his son, Jesus Christ. God's grace revealed in their lives as this Holy Spirit would empower them to be holy as God is holy, verse 15 and 16. And of course, they were encouraged to remember, to honor God with fear and awe. Why? Because the day will come when he will judge the living and the dead impartially. Verse 17. Well, friends, this brings us to verse 22. Let's read that together. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. You see, the Apostle Peter here had reminded them, up to this point, of two important characteristics of their salvation in Christ. Same for us as well today. One, believers were to be holy. Verse 15, for God said, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Verse 16, there Peter quoting from Leviticus. And holiness would be revealed in the believer's life and all their conduct. Second, the believers were to grow in their fear of God and conduct themselves, conduct ourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Another way of saying exile is sojourning. They were encouraged to conduct themselves with the fear of the Lord in their lives as Christians as they were facing these struggles. And that that would be right right, right up to our time as well. We have our own sojourning to do, our own life to live, and we will have trouble along the way, and we are to conduct ourselves in the fear and admonition of the good Lord. But the question is, why fear God? Why have a fear and reverence of God? Again, we are reminded what Peter said, that the day will come when God will judge impartially believers themselves as well, according to each one's deeds. Verse 17. Yet believers, we know, have been ransomed, set free from their futile ways of life, their sinful life, their uh, lostness by the precious blood of Christ. And sin, my friends, and death no longer have power or had power over them, over all believers. The Apostle Peter could say, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. This is the first half of verse 22, which I am calling verse 22a. Let's take a look at this term, having purified. This is translated from a Greek verb, and it points to the moral character of a believer. Not the outward actions, but the inward sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in a believer. In other words, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit changes the Christian's moral compass. It purifies our morality. morality. uh, Previous to salvation, previous to repentance, and all that that means, uh, these first century Christians were following the drumbeat, if you will, or the compass uh, of the culture, of the world, as we were as well. But now they, have, they dedicate themselves to living a morally pure life, the best that they can, not perfect. And this holy living they are uh, uh, encouraged to do is revealed, as Peter said, by your obedience to truth. By your obedience to that truth. What truth? Well, simply the revelation of God in Christ, as we find in his word. We go to the Apostle Paul in his introductory comments to the Roman church. And he noted there that he had been set apart by the gospel of God. Chapter 1, verse 1. This was the gospel that Paul would say was concerning his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 3. And the gospel of God had brought about in Paul the obedience that comes from faith. Faith produced obedience. And faith in Christ begins, my friends, with the initial act of obedience into the new life. The new creation that God does in a person. And we see here in Peter's letter, this is an essential characteristic of a believer from that point on the rest of their lives. So this begs the question, 
And, and think about it. Do you struggle with obedience? Do you struggle with obedience? And then have you ever asked yourself why obedience is important to God? As you think about those questions, uh, one of the major themes that we find in Peter's letter concerns faith. And rightly so, because we remember what the writer of the letters of Hebrews said about the importance of faith. The writer said, and without faith it is impossible to please him, that is God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You find that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And my friends, the test of genuine faith is that our lifestyles will be characterized by righteousness. In other words, we will be living our lives like Jesus did. And there's a caveat here, of course. Jesus was perfect. We are not. We will sin. We will fall in sin from time to time. But the traction, the ongoing traction, the moral compass of our lives will be going towards, towards God, not away from God. We want to live our lives like Jesus lived his. We want to obey the commands of God as Jesus obeyed his Father. We want to obey the commands of God as found in his word, his inspired holy word. Not out of duty, my friends, not out of compliance, not out of legalism, not out of those kinds of things, but because we want to, because we truly love God with all our soul and all our spirit and all our strength. And we do so by the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do this uh, Christian life following Christ without the power of the Holy Spirit. And thanks be to God that he's in given us his Holy Spirit. Then we can live out our life rejoicing and giving God all the glory for all he has done in and through his son Jesus Christ. Because God is to get all the glory. This includes in our deeds as well. Listen to what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount concerning the believer's deeds. Let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Well, let's go back to verse 16, 22. There's a conjunction here. You might notice in yours and uh, in your verse as well. Verse 22 it starts with four. So let's read verse 22b together. For a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from pure heart. So I have a question for you. What is the subject of this verse? What is the subject of this verse? Well, the answer is love. And this is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.22, which is made manifest in a believer's lifestyle of holiness and an obedience to God, which leads to a lifestyle of love, not separate from holiness and obedience, but all together. We return to Jesus and John's gospel, as we began with that in, in the introductory comments, as he was preparing his disciples for his arrest and death. And we said earlier, or Jesus said earlier in our, in our, our, our message here, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. John chapter 13, verse 34. So here's another question to challenge us, to challenge you. How are believers to love one another? Answer, just as I have loved you, Jesus said. Then we have to ask the other question. How did Jesus love you and me? And friends, this is an important question. All of these are. This question really is for each of us to answer on our own. We have to come up with the answer. I can't make the answer for you. Remember the question that we uh, were to ponder at the very beginning? Why do Christians find it so hard to love one another? Let me encourage you to read the Gospels again. Soon, as soon as you can. There you will find how Jesus loved you and me. And I, can say, I can't say it any other way than this. Every believer, you and I, is responsible to know their Bibles as best as they can. And if you cannot answer the question, how Jesus loves you and me, then you will not know what Jesus meant when he said, just as I have loved you. Well, let's go back to the text Check out this phrase, sincere brotherly love. As you think about this, and I gave it some thought this past week for sure, in our cultural context, we are somewhat hindered when it comes to understanding how the New Testament uses the word love. 
I have the ESV and I think it does a good job of translating the original Greek verb here in our text. So the meaning of this phrase is used in the New Testament of the, lo of, of the love that Christians have for their brothers and sisters in Christ. This of course would include all believers in the world as it was for the first century as it is for us. This is the kind of love that is used to describe a love between siblings and a family you know, of kindness and affection for one another. Now notice how Peter expands on sincere brotherly love when he said, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Verse 22b. Here we find a different Greek word being used to describe love. Now the Greek here is translated, transliterated, agapeo, and we translate it love. This Greek verb in the imperative mood or in the command mood has a sense to have a great affection or care for or loyalty towards. We can use words like cherish or have affection to, to describe agapeo. This is a believer's love toward other believers and those outside the church does not originate from our emotions, feelings. This is not an emotional response necessarily. Emotions are involved, of course, always. But the basis of this love is not our emotions, our feelings, because they can change from moment to moment. It's not puppy love, it's none of that gushy mushy stuff. And sometimes when we think about this kind of love that the New Testament talks about, it will go against our natural inclination. Because we are told in the Bible to love one another, love everyone, including the, <laughs> those on the peripheral of culture. The poor, the sick, the mentally handicapped, all those people. We don't walk by them, we love them and we do something about it because love is an action word. It's a verb. This love does not isolate itself toward those who we only get along with. We don't just hang out with our own kind. We love all people. This is a love beyond race and color and creed or station in life. This is a love that seeks the good of all. The Apostle Paul put it this way, let us, each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself. Romans 15, 2. This is a love that does no wrong to another. Paul would put it this way, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. Romans 15, 10. You might have noticed the word here, law. What law? Well, we already heard it from Jesus himself when challenged by the lawyer. It is the second greatest commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 37, 40. In other words, believers seek opportunities. They seek to opportunities. They don't sit on their laurels. They seek opportunities to do good to everyone, especially the household of faith. And that's from Galatians 6, verse 10. Last but not least here in verse 22, please notice the modifying word, earnestly. This adverb here modifying the subject, love. Let's put it into the context. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. If you're using the New King James Version, it uses the word fervently. The NIV uses the word deeply. I think you get the sense here. This has a meaning. It's eagerly, it's constantly to exert oneself with one's energy. This is not a quiet love. This is an action love. Again, not out of feelings, but out of our knowledge and, and fear and awe and holiness of God. Again, we appeal to the Apostle Paul for commentary. He said this, Love must be genuine. Abhor what is evil or hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. Well, this, friends, we turn, we turn to the question of the day. Why do Christians find it so hard to love one another? You know, friends, if we were to compile the reasons, it would fill a list from the moon and back, I'm sure. And it might even sound appropriate in some cases. But we know this, believers hurt other believers. Believers hurt other people, period, in all sorts of ways. So there's no way denying the pain that this causes, causes others. And this creates brokenness, whether it's false teaching, whether it's 
uh, error, whether it's heresy, whether it's just us interacting with each other and others. Remember what the Word of God said. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Romans 12, 18. Having said this, we remind that both Peter and Paul are describing a love that needs to be worked out even in difficult times. Remember, this letter was written to people going through various trials. When you and I go through various trials, we need to continue to love this way, to love each other this way, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And sometimes all a believer can do is love someone from a distance. Praying for reconciliation, praying for forgiveness, whether it's their own or the others. And the end of the day, a believer's love toward others is an obedient, sacrificial love as Christ was obedient to his Father. It may not feel good, all this, but it is a genuine, loving response of a believer who, according to the Apostle Peter, has had been, has been, had been, sorry, born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Verse 23. So with all this in mind, we're going to just switch gears a little bit, or twist, not twist it, move in a different direction slightly, along with the word here. And one commentator in regards to verse 23 said this, quote, We are born again through the word of God. But it doesn't only give us new life. It also tells us to love one another. We are obligated by it and empowered by it to live out the kind of love and holiness Peter speaks of. I just want to repeat that last part. We are obligated by it and empowered by it, that is the word of God, to live out the kind of love and holiness Peter speaks of here in verse, uh, the verses we're dealing with. End quote. You know, as we think about our times uh, in the Western church culture, when it comes to the way folks deal with the Word of God, uh, you know, there's really nothing new over the history of the church here. But it's interesting, even in our day, the Word of God has often been misapplied, misunderstood, uh, taught wrong, uh, you know, proof text, you name it, and even hated by those who call themselves Christians. There's a fellow back in the 19th century by the name of Charles Hayden Spurgeon. You might have heard of him. You might even have some of his material. He was a very, very powerful preacher and teacher during the 19th century. He said this of his day, quote, God's word never dies. God's word never changes. There are some who think we ought to get a new gospel every few years or even every few weeks, but that was not Peter's notion. Speaking of Peter's letter, you know, Spurgeon, I think, might as well have been speaking about our current Christian cult context in the West. There are so many new Gospels out there, so new interpretations, so new uh, uh, day, uh, ways of believing in Jesus that it's almost impossible to sort it out sometimes. But for Peter, he could not be more sure about the abiding Word of God, verse 23 we see now he quotes, uh, quoted Isaiah 40, verse 6 and 8. And here we have a word picture. And the picture looks like this. All people, you and I, those first century Christians, Peter himself, are like the flowers of the grass. Here today and gone tomorrow. For the grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Verse 24 and 25. Well, friends, in summary, unlike the impermanence of people this side of heaven, the Word of God is unchanging. The Word of God is the ever-present Word of God's truth. The Word of God meets the needs of every believer in every situation and circumstances they face in life for the, all their life until they graduate to heaven for the good and the bad and ugly times of life. After all, the Word of God it's the good news that was preached to you and me that saved us from the wrath and judgment of God to come. So what are we left with today? Well, we're left with that question. Why do Christians find it so hard to love one another? And at the end of the day, my dear ones, only you can answer this question. Apostle Peter has done his part to help us and exhort us to a lifestyle of holiness and love. God help us to do so in these days that we live. Let us pray. Dear Father, I thank you.
for your word. I thank you for Peter's letter. Thank you for the encouragement it is and also the, uh, the um, certainly the uh, discipline that is happening in our hearts because of uh, this message today. I pray, Lord, that we would honor you by obeying your word and by living our lives as best we can like Jesus. And uh, we ask for your uh, wisdom and discernment and strength to do so. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Shalom.